started. I have with me sitting here in the Hangout uh, our first speaker for today, Brian Rinaldi. He is speaking from Boston. Currently, Brian works at Telerik, the makers of Kendo UI, and he is a developer content manager there. He's also the co-editor of Mobile Web Weekly, blogs frequently about web, mobile, and JavaScript uh, at his blog, remotesynthesis.com, and has been blogging a lot about Jekyll lately. Uh, we first crossed paths with Brian when he presented at the San Francisco HTML5 meetup earlier this year, uh, and we're excited by his talk for this conference to help establish some context for the current technology landscape uh, that Jekyll exists in. I'm really thankful for Brian, to Brian for giving up his time on what is surely a busy day today because he is running the Telerik Next conference in Boston from tomorrow until the 5th of May. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Brian and he'll take you through for our first talk of JekyllConf. All right, you can hear me fine? Can indeed. All right, great. Thanks for the intro. I'm going to switch to screen share here. Um, hold on. Get my slides going. All right. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you can see the slides just fine, right? Are you again? Perfect. All right, I'll get going. Um, OK, so some of you may know, especially those like interested in boxing, that there's a big fight going on tonight. Um, Floyd Manny, Mary, Merriweather versus Manny Pacquiao. I'm not a boxing fan myself, but I thought I'd pick on that theme um, as we examine Jekyll comparing it to the competition. So I had, being a bit of a geek myself, I loved the game Punch-Out. I don't know if any of you remember it, but it was a great game. They even remade it for the Wii, um, and it was still pretty good. So anyway, um, as was mentioned before, I work for Telerik. We make Kendo UI. We also make something called NativeScript, um, which is for building mobile apps with JavaScript. We make a lot of .NET controls, uh, native UI controls, and tons of other stuff. We don't make anything particularly relevant to Jekyll. It's just been a fascination of my own um, that I picked up. I've been kind of uh, in love with static sites for a while and just have started a project, which is partly what I'll be talking about here, um, to look at different engines. So this is the hero of our little story here, Jekyll. Um, and we're gonna, he's going to face up against a number of different engines. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Jekyll himself towards the end. But first, we wanna, I want to look at like Jekyll. I'm assuming that everybody here has either used Jekyll in some manner or has, is interested in Jekyll and knows at least enough about Jekyll that we, you'll understand some of these comparisons as we look at different engines. So before we start, let's set some of the rules of the fight. First of all, Everything I tell you is that these are these are all my opinions. These are not like you may try out the same engine that I compare Jekyll to and find complete. You have a completely different opinion of it than I do. Um, for instance, as a as an example, I've occasionally presented this where uh, somebody who is very very comfortable in Ruby um, has a different opinion of a of a Ruby based. Um, static site engine than I do, while I, whereas I find, for instance, some of the JavaScript-based ones easy because I know JavaScript well enough that I can dig into the code sometimes. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all my opinion. They're all subjective, um, but uh, hopefully, you know, you take that with a, with a grain of salt, but it'll kind of guide you towards what some of the other engines have to offer and what some of their drawbacks are. So I'm going to look at things like documentation, how hard it is to get started and set and set up in the engine, um, the language support, like you know which, which in terms of which templating languages does that particular engine support, which does it support things like SAS or or um, or less or other you know preprocessors and stuff out of the box. Uh, so I'm gonna. I also took a look at each. Every time I looked at a new engine, I looked at each with using the default templating. Um, by that I mean, every one of these engines generally will spit you out a uh, base, kind of like Jekyll does. It'll spit you out a base site that is uses um, a default templating engine. So I use whenever I built the site using one of these engines, I use that default templating engine, even if. There were plugins or other extensions that could support other uh, 
templating engines, it just kind of seemed fair to use what it kind of guides you to by default. So like when I look at Jekyll, I would look at Liquid. Um, and other ones, I would use whatever their default is. So in terms of how easy it is to add content to the site um, and things like that, uh, can it does it support things like dynamic and custom data? And then in this case, again, I use the defaults because um, some of them some of them support like both YAML, JSON, um, TOML, I guess it's called. I, there's all kinds of different for data formats that are supported, and I use whatever kind of def if it generates something, whatever the default is. Um, how extensible is it? And I'm saying a project health assessment. It's just kind of like um, how does it, is it actively being developed? And in, in the case of pretty much everyone here that I'm going to talk about, they're all pretty well under active development, but that's just, you know, if it's being up regularly updated is something I'd consider um, when I looked at these. So this is all based on a project that I have created here, um, which is at this, uh, I have on GitHub, my static site samples. I'm going to show it to you just to get this, so you get a sense of um, what it is. Uh, right, hold on. Oh, I don't have that URL open. Static site samples. So basically, I have created a number of samples for a whole bunch of different sites, and that's what we're going to look at um, to do the comparison here today. Uh, you'll see I have you know a bunch of the different sites here, including a Jekyll one. I have instructions on how to get set up for each one. And if any of you are curious, some of them, including the Jekyll example, um, and the Wintersmith example and others have actual like full tutorials that are, I link to that are, are posted somewhere else showing you how to actually um, how I built the different samples and how you could go ahead and build them yourself so it teaches you about the templating and about the data and about getting set up and all that stuff um, not everyone has that so it's just a couple of them I don't have unending free time unfortunately so um, but let's, I'm also going to show you what the site is to get, give you a sense of what it is we're using to compare. Because what I did was I built exactly the same site repeatedly using different engines so, so that I could e more easily compare them. And we could, you, you could get a sense when you go through the code of how each does something differently, right? So this is what the site looks like. <clears throat> Any of you are, are fans of Adventure Time, it's a cartoon on Cartoon Network, and this would kind of be an imaginary Adventure Time fan site. Um, I've got <clears throat> a list of um, the main characters, and these are, are actually driven by uh, custom data. So that was part of my test was, well, can I, can I actually add how easy it is to add and then display custom data where I want it to. Um, and then we have, if you scroll down, we have different posts. And I've separated them so like these are the, like the most recent two posts and you know with with some images as well as you know all the posts that follow that um, and that that actually allowed me to do things like see how easy it is to say split out like oh, show the first two and then show the next five and so on um, which seems like it should be a simple thing but in some engines that turned out to be a real uh, pain in my butt uh, as well as like this is run via site-wide custom data, like a custom metadata. So like that runs the image here in the description. Just simple things like that. But what I figured was these are the basics that any site would need to do. Um, as well as like these have custom descriptions here. So each post has a specific custom metadata. Um, like can I break? Can I, where, can I break the, the post so that I can add a, a basically a custom, um, what do you call this, excerpt? And then these are like a, a custom short description that I can add to each post. So those are things I, I did on each, and each engine handles that differently. And then the post page is pretty simple. It's just, it's just the post um, with the image. So getting back to the comparison, so those are that's that's the project we're going to use to kind of make the comparisons. The first one I'm going to talk about is Harp. Um, Harp is available at uh, harpjs.com. So you can see Harp is right here, harpjs.com. This is the Harp site. 
So look, at, one of the things I'm going to get put up front is that this is one of my biases. I don't like Jade. Um, and I, I've, I've talked about this in my talk, the HTML5 dev, uh, uh, user group that I spoke to. I, I'm not a fan of Jade. I find Jade to be kind of tedious and difficult. Um, it's supposed to be easier and sh more shorthand. Um, but uh, I find it to be actually slightly more complicated uh, than just writing straight HTML. For those of you who aren't familiar already with Jade, Jade would look like, I'm going to show you what one, this is the harp site. So here's my indexed Jade. And as you can see, like, you don't have any closing tags. You leave off all the brackets. The uh, attributes are all in this parentheses with, you know, the, like this would be a tribute class equal to major, and it's, it's within a parentheses and stuff. So that's kind of what Jade looks like. Use kind of these shorthand, uh, you know, h3 equal to character name, and that would actually print out the character name within an h, uh, h3 block, and so on. That's kind of what Jade looks like. So I'm a bit biased that I don't like Jade, and, and Harp uses Jade as well as some of the others we'll look at as kind of the default. So, uh, you know, take that into, into consideration when you hear me criticize it for the templating is because, well, I, I'm not a fan of doing building the templates in Jade myself. So on, on each of these, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I didn't like first, and then I'll tell you what I did like. And then you can kind of, in, in, depending on your level of, of knowledge of Jekyll itself, you can kind of know how that compares with Jekyll. And then we'll talk a little bit about Jekyll at the end, as I mentioned. So the bad news about Harp is that it has extremely limited documentation. Um, it, there isn't a lot to show you how to do things. Um, and in fact, that's compounded by the fact that the community is pretty small of users. So like, there are a few people who have blogged about it and stuff like that, but it doesn't have, there aren't a lot of places to search for answers if you can't find them in the documentation. Another really big drawback to Harp is that it doesn't support any kind of plugins or extensions. Um, you can add your, you know, these custom themes and stuff like that, which has some pseudo features built in. But beyond that, you can't like add support for something that doesn't have already pre-built in. Um, so that's just out of the question. Um, post metadata is separate from the post, and I'm going to show you what that means. So. If we look at the, this is the code for, uh, for the Harp site built. The, I built it twice, and I'm not really going to cover the EJS version. So since I hated Jade so much, I wanted to see if I was just being biased. Um, so I tried it with EJS. Um, it didn't change my opinion that much, to be quite honest. So when you go to the posts, the post is here. And you notice it doesn't even have a title. It doesn't have any kind of metadata in the post itself. Um, you actually have to have this data.json file, and that's where you list each post. So and that's where I would put, much like the front matter in Jekyll, that's where I would put the metadata for each post here. So it does allow you to put it per post, but it, you have to have this file. And then what it does is, in fact, when you call for posts, it doesn't return them to you in any kind of date order. You have to make sure that this is maintained in the order you want to receive them. So. You know, I find that a bit um, of a pain to have to separate the post from its metadata, um, and that's why I, I can I consider it a bit of a drawback. So um, again, as I mentioned, the posts are returned in the order that they that um, that they exist in the JSON metadata. So it's not so easy to necessarily order things in a different way without manually changing the file. Another thing I want to note. I'll look at, if we look at the code here, um, there aren't, and I should have noted in these drawbacks, there aren't a lot of built-in helpers for things like, say, formatting a date and so on. So if you look at at the code here for, uh, sorry, for index.j, for instance, there is no built-in excerpt um, in, in Harp, so I had to build something to split uh, my excerpt so I could make a custom excerpt. There wasn't any built-in um, date formatting functionality. So I, I wrote a little function here that it runs inside my template that like will actually format the date for me nicely. 
So those to me is like, you know, those are pretty basic and I find it to be a pretty heavy drawback um, to not have those built in. Now the good news, as far as Harp is concerned, it supports Jade, Markdown, EGS, Coffee Script, SAS, Less, and Stylus all out of the box. Uh, you don't need to add anything. So like, you know, while you can't add extensions, a lot of things are supported straight out of the box. Um, it also functions as a static server with built-in preprocessing. What that means is like, if I just wanted something, if I'm writing in, um, you know, using any of those particular um, languages, I could actually run that locally using a Harp server just for testing purposes without ever having to compile anything. Like I don't even need to have like a grunt script or a gulp script basically watching the files. These, it will actually have the, it has the preprocessing built in so I can live preview uh, any file built in Jade or Markdown or, or CoffeeScript or so on. Um, it does have a, a really easy deployment option, which is the Harp, something called the Harp platform. It is not a free option, but it is really simple to deploy where you just basically put your, your posts in a Google, um, sorry, a Dropbox folder, and it will automatically add them to your, to your blog, and, and it will update and everything. So that's an easy option. Again, not free, but that's just, I find that to be, if you're looking for something simple, that's, that's actually something that other platforms don't necessarily have yet. Um, and I find, compared to the, the other options that are out there, that you know, installing uh, via NPM is very, very easy. So I kind of prefer that. I find that to be a benefit. Um, there is no issue, generally speaking, when we're dealing with NPM of like, oh, you know, I'm on Windows or I'm on Linux or I'm on Mac. It generally works across the board. Uh, none of the projects that I've used built, um, built that way have any had any cross-platform issues. So that's simple, which is one of the few drawbacks I find with Jekyll. I've tested out the, you know, the Windows workaround, but it's not officially supported. The workaround works fine, but it's just the fact that there isn't necessarily that official support, at least according to the site and everything, yet. Um, it's a bit of a drawback and maybe something that, that say, people on Windows might second guess whether they want to do, use it. Um, so those are, those are the good things about Harp. Uh, I, you know, if you're interested in it, check, again, harpjs.com and you can check that one out. So another one that I looked at is, uh, is goes by the name of Hexo, and it's, I'll show you that, that site as well. So where's Hexo here? Hexo, this is, he this is the Hexo site, um, and it's also an NPM installable option, so it's built with JavaScript. And if we look at the, the Hexo sample is right here, um, you can see that like it has slightly different way that it organizes things. It's, it puts all this uh, code into source. Uh, you can install node modules and so on. Um, and it has this idea of scaffolds, which scaffolds is one of the nice things uh, about it is uh, you basically create, like if I want to create a new page or I want to create a new post, I tell Hexo, hey, create new page, and it'll generate me a template based on this scaffold. Um, what's nice about that is that I can customize that so that, you know, if there's, say, some custom metadata or something that I generally have in a, in a post or a page, I can, I can include that in my scaffold so that it, every time it generates me a new one to start with, um, I can use that. So the bad news about Hexo is that if you, look, if you had gone through the site that I showed you, um, the documentation, I remember somebody recommended this to me, and I'm like, oh, well, I had just used another one that was, like, very, very poorly documented. I'm like, oh, well, this one at least is documented. It shouldn't be that hard, right? Uh, the documentation looks like it has all the, you know, everything you need, and then when you start building it, it's lacking some really, really key um, information. Like, I basically had to do lots of trial and error. I'm going to, just as an example, when you go in, and you want to look at the data files. And this is all the information it gave you. As you can see, um, it, it basically tells you kind of where to put it and what, uh, what language is, you know, YAML or JSON, and then how to do a very simple loop over the, you know, a very simple key-based uh, data file. 
but uh, you know, if you wanted to do anything more complex than that, in my case, I want to output those characters, there's zero information here on how to do that. That's as far as it goes. So, I mean, I went through a lot, a lot of trial and error to get the, that particular feature working, for instance. Uh, in the end, you know, I, so I have my data file to YAML, and in the end, I just kind of, well, no, this is the post themes. I'm going to show you layouts. So if we go in here, I mean, you know, I had to go through a lot of trial and error to figure out how to actually access deeper data within that um, within that YAML file, within that data file. So that to me was a, a big drawback. Um, there aren't a lot of pre-built themes available. This may not be a big deal to you if you really want to customize your site. Uh, so, but if you, but if you're looking for something that has, a, you know kind of makes it easy for you to, to choose from a number of options to customize your, uh, the look and feel of your site. This one doesn't have a ton of pre-built stuff. And I ran into something that's just, I swear I spent hours trying to figure this out. Um, what it does by default is it tries to render anything that's in this uh, source folder. So I had to specifically go in and this was after I, um, a lot of trying to figure out what, what the heck was going on and why, I, why things were not showing up um, because it wasn't erroring out. It just wouldn't show up right. And all of my JavaScript was broken and, and my CSS was broken. And basically, I had to kind of tell it to not render anything with the .js uh, it, uh, basically extension, which to me seems like, uh, you know, kind of a, a silly thing in my opinion. I, I didn't agree with that decision that they they apparently say this was a choice, a purposeful choice. So it tries to render all these .js files, which then uh, it doesn't, and these are, like I just had jQuery in there, and it was trying to render my jQuery file and and was not, it was not working. So it would basically cut off the file somewhere halfway through. So. Uh, I had to. I told it to ignore all the JS files, and then then it suddenly worked. But that took a lot of figuring out. It wasn't something documented in the documentation at all. Uh, the good news about it is it has this idea. My example doesn't use it, but it has this idea of asset folders, which are tied to a post. So each post has a corresponding asset folder, which makes a really easy place to play to store your images and other assets for a post. Um, but so that that's, helps you keep that stuff organized, and I think that's a good feature. Um, they There are quite a few plugins available for it, and they claim that most Octopress plugins work. I haven't tested that, but that's one of the claims that they make on their on their homepage. Um, it has it has a lot of uh, one basically a lot of s simple deployment options that are well, like a one command deploy. You configure it in your configuration file, and then when you're done making your changes, you just hit deploy. And it's got a it's got a number of options, right down to just straight FTP or GitHub pages or um, other you know common options like Heroku and so on. So that's a really nice thing. I think deployment having the deployment deployment built in is is something that uh, kind of one of the key features that they have over say Jekyll, for instance. Um, and again, it's it's easily installable via npm. So, let's see how we're doing on time. Oh, shoot. I better get going. Uh, okay, we're Jekyll versus Wintersmith. Wintersmith is available at uh, wintersmith.io. This is the Wintersmith page. Um, so, I'm going to, since we're already kind of running short on time, I'll just go through the bad news. I won't go through the code so much. The code is available on the uh, GitHub page that I linked to earlier, and I'll show that again. So, the bad news on Wintersmith, it's another uh, JavaScript-based one. So the bad news about it is the documentation is basically just a quick start guide. Um, and in order to get my version of the site working, I basically had to read through all the source. Uh, the only give thing I'll give them credit for on that is that the source was easily readable, and so I was able to figure everything out. But I just couldn't even figure out, say, how to access data and, or how to, how to uh, say, you know, uh, limit my loops or how, you know, things like that that were just basic things to me that I couldn't figure out based on their documentation, which just, which just 
basically walked you through getting set up uh, for a basic site. Uh, it defaults to Jade again, so I count that as a negative, but you know, if you like Jade, I guess that could be a positive to you. Uh, and the data has to be separated into individual JSON files. I will show that quickly. So this is our, uh, just so you can understand what that means. And this was another thing that was not well documented. So I had to actually split, oh no, this is not the Hexo. Oh, oh this is, yeah, this is, I'm in Hexo, not Wintersmith, sorry. Here's Wintersmith. Um, and then we're going to go to, uh, where is it? Plugins, the contents, care, oh, okay. So I had to name, you. and this was, again, not well documented. You had to name the folder whatever you wanted the data to be under. Like, say, if I wanted under the characters variable, it had to be in characters. And then I had to separate each character, rather than putting it each in its own file, I had to separate each one into its own JSON file. Um, to get this to work. That was the only way I could get it to work, and I, which I found kind of silly um, and, and tedious to, to actually do, but in a way it was it was kind of nice, so it's more like a Jekyll Collections, I guess, than, than like the data files, but so in a way it has some nice aspects to it, but I found it kind of tedious, especially if you're give, dealing with a large amount of data, that could be a pain. Um, and it's also, if it doesn't, if it supports some kind of other way of handling it, it's absolutely not documented, and I couldn't figure it out. So um, that that's just kind of ended up being with the way that I got it to work. Uh, there are a lot of plugins out there for it. Um, there are a lot of examples of sites built using Wintersmith. So, and most of them are are listed um, on their examples page. Uh, they're they're real world sites. They're actually out in production, but they a lot of them are open source. So you can check. A nice way, if you can't figure something out, um, which, again, since it's not well documented, you usually can't, a nice way is to go to their examples and just look at how somebody else did this, something similar to what you're trying to do. Adding NPM modules is really, really easy. I can just, you know, it comes with some pre-built in, like Moment.js for handling dates, so no need for helpers or anything for handling dates or other aspects of uh, formatting and things like that. I can just use NPM modules and it's easy to install them and integrate them into the site. So that was a nice uh, feature. Uh, so if you're already you know, well versed in JavaScript or Node, that might be e really, really easy option for you. So Hugo is actually another engine based on Go, the Go language, uh, which is from Google. And so it's a static site, site generator based on Go. Um, so, let me show you the site really quickly. So it's available at gohugo.io. They got a really nice site, I think, um, and it's actually, you know, well documented. So, the bad news for me personally about Hugo is that I found that the Go language was very different than what I'm used to, um, and, you know. I, for instance, I feel like I can use Jekyll and not necessarily need to know Ruby very well, um, but I couldn't, I didn't feel I could use Go, I mean, sorry, Hugo, and not understand Go. In fact, I often found to solve problems that weren't in the documentation um, that I had to actually go into the Go language reference and search for some information about how data structures are handled and things like that. So, while I will actually say the docs are pretty good, they have a lot of documentation and they cover a lot of use cases, there are some key details that are missing. Oftentimes what I find it lacks, it has, it tells you how to do, like generally how to do something, but it lacks in any examples. And, sin, and unless you're very, very comfortable in Go, you often find you don't understand the syntax of it, at least that's my, per, you know, uh, like it'll tell you something's a function, but how you actually reference a function in Go is slightly different. So it was a little hard to get used to. Um, and I found it really hard to find help. While there it does seem to be a decent community around Hugo, I found it hard to find help when I got stuck, mostly because, like, if you're trying to search for answers, uh, it actually comes up with all kinds of irrelevant things about Hugo the movie and Hugo, uh, you know, famous people named Hugo, and it was just very, very hard to find anything. Um, I didn't find a lot of people blogging about it, but there does seem to be at least a decent community behind it. The good thing is that it 
compiled so blazingly fast, I thought it didn't work. Um, and I granted, this is a very simple site, um, but you know, having used all of these, I've seen the way how fast they compile, and this was so fast. I mean, it took just milliseconds to to compile this site, um, and that's one of the things that they boast about on their homepage, and, and it's it's definitely true. Um, it has a nice little command line for generating new pages and new posts, which was also uh, in I think it was Hexo. Um, it they they place an emphasis on respecting your content organization, so you don't need to like necessarily name things a particular way or place things in a particular folder. You can place them wherever you want them to be on your particular site, and that's where it'll generate them. And there's ways to kind of control that but, uh, and configure it. But so that's one of the nice features I think about it. Um, all right, so last one since we're running low on time anyway, that works out, is uh, Middleman. Some of you may have heard of Middleman. It's a Ruby-based uh, as well, just like Jekyll, Ruby-based engine. Uh, Middleman is available at middlemanapp.com. So the things I, I found in, my, in building that site with Middleman that I didn't like was I found that the setup and configuration was way more complex than, say, I was used to with Jekyll or even some of these other sites. It was uh, the, the uh, here, I'll sh quickly show it. So, middleman site. So you have to, th there's this configuration file and the gem file, and you had to, uh, there was another, there was other configurations in here as well. Um, but it was a little bit harder to set up um, things like like live reload weren't actually built in. You had to load in. There's all these basically, um, I forget what their term is for it, but basically additional modules that support all kinds of features, and those all had to be added into this gem file. Some of them were built in, but some of them you had to actually go, like if you're trying to figure out why it's not live reloading, you had to, I had to go look for documentation and, oh, okay, there's actually a module I have to load in to do the live reloading, and I have to add it to this gem file, and I have to add it to this configuration file, then run the, ins the bundle install, and so on. So I found just for some of the features I thought would come out of the box, um, I had to do a, lot of, a little bit of work. Um, it, it does actually, if you're not a Ruby developer, I feel like you do actually have to understand Ruby a little bit better to understand middleman. Um, people with, like I've talked to people who've used it who are Ruby developers and they think it's great. I'm not, and so I found it a little bit tough. Um, but, uh, but if you are, again, your, your opinion of that might change. Uh, and it looks like they are going to be releasing a, a major update and it has some significant breaking changes. Um, although, obviously, that remains to be seen. It's not out yet, but that could be something, if you're considering launching something today, if uh, an update like that is around the corner and it's going to be breaking stuff that, to consider. Um, it has excellent documentation. I had no trouble building the site in terms of finding resources to help. There's a good community around it, um, you know, reasonably good-sized community around it. Uh, there's a lot of developers using it, so where you couldn't find stuff in the documentation, I could find it elsewhere. Uh, part of the thing about why you, I think it's a little bit tougher to set up is that it is designed to be much more like configurable and customizable than other engines. So, so it's not necessarily for building a blog; it's for building a site, uh, and it could be a fairly complex site. Um, it does actually have like modules you add in to basically support blogging, so that it's not even your default out of the box implementation isn't a blog. Um, it, so. And it's it's designed to be basically tight, you know, kind of like driving stick as opposed to driving automatic. There's not a lot of automatic in middleman, um, but you know you get a lot of con tight control over the things that you do. Um, and again, there's a large community. There's a ton of extensions and a ton of templates out there already for it. So going back to our here, the hero of the story here. How does Jekyll fare when you look at it compared to all of these? Um, the good news, in my opinion, and I'm not just saying this because I'm at Jekyll Conf, uh, my opinion, having used these, and I, you have to take it with a grain of salt as well because I've only used six, well, seven of the 300 and some odd options for static site engines out there. Um, 
I, I'm trying to go through all of the major ones. Uh, these aren't all of them, but these are some of the, the major ones that, that you know at least have some kind of uh, large amount of community support. But Jekyll, of the ones I've used, Jekyll's still the best option. Uh, Jekyll seems to have a really good size and still growing community. There's lots of resources out there for help. Um, there are a ton of plugins. There's a ton of tools being built around Jekyll. And I find that, that uh, you know, it's hard to say anything has perfect documentation. And I definitely wouldn't necessarily say the Jekyll documentation is anywhere near perfect, but it's among the best of the documentation I've encountered uh, for static site engines so far. Um, so I think Jekyll has a lot of great things going for it, and it's definitely, if I were recommending to somebody who wanted to get started in static site engines today, I would definitely recommend they choose Jekyll. So the bad news. And this is what I think is not specific to Jekyll. This is in terms of, in general. Um, the bad news is that we haven't reached beyond hardcore developers. None of these are easy to use for somebody who isn't an experienced developer, in my opinion. Um, Markdown is a terrible option for writers. Uh, developers love it, but writers hate it, and they can't use the tools they're used to writing in. So basically offering these sites as, a t as an option for uh, somebody who's who's doing, you know, who basically we're maintaining a site, but we have a number of writers, say documentation writers and so on. They don't like using Markdown, and it's understandable. It's a it's a kind of complex abstraction because we need to give them, teach them both Markdown, and then the HTML for the places that Markdown doesn't work, and so on. Now, I think Mike has a talk coming up later that may talk about something that you know there are people working on solving this problem. Um, so. And, and Mike's talk may, may touch on that, so uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Again, there, these are, um, I have an article that covered this, comparing Jekyll, Harp, and Roots. I didn't cover Roots here, and it's not in the samples, but I have actually tested it out. Um, and then uh, you can find the uh, examples on uh, that GitHub resources page. Um, use, useful lists, the, the static, static site generators.net, and staticgen.com give you a list of all kinds of, uh, of other engines if you want to see what else is out there and compare before you end up deciding that you're best off going to Jekyll. Um, anyway, uh, so given that it's time for questions and Q&A, uh, if you don't get to answer your question answered here today, uh, please feel free to ping me at RamonSynth on, on Twitter or brian.rinaldi at telerik.com. So I will stop sharing at this point and um, open up for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, time for a couple of quick questions here. Uh, the first one uh, is, why do you think there are so many static site generators at the moment? I mean, you said you researched seven, but there's over 300 listed on static gen. Do you have any uh, insight into that? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think it's any different than a lot of things in, in the community right now. Uh, I think. It, we, we've got a bit of a, everybody wants to be famous for creating some, you know, some tool or something, so everybody recreates the same tool, and I have some theories on to what, as to why that is, but I, again, I don't think in this case it's any different than, say, your JavaScript frameworks um, mm -hmm. that seem to come out with a new JavaScript framework every day, you know, and it's, you know, that might be a slight exaggeration, but but it feels like there's a new one every day, and it's hard to keep up with what's going on with them. So, you know, it, even if, for instance, you look at the templating languages, all of these seem to use one, you know, they don't all use the same templating languages. A lot of them use, uh, you know, different ones, and they're all almost very, very similar outside of Jade. Mm -hmm. They're all very, very similar and solve the same problems over and over again. There's just slight, like one might include a dash where the other one has, you know, just the parentheses, or, or sorry, uh, um, not a parentheses, a percent symbol. It, it's just, it's it's a slight variation, and they're solving the same problem over and over again. I don't understand why it's been done so many times, but so it's it's a problem we have, I think, in general in the community, in the developer community, not specific to this um, issue. Cool, awesome. Um, another question here uh, is, you know, how far down the easy install path do you think that uh, Jekyll should should be looking to go? Um, should should all the dependencies, including Ruby, be included in a in uh, installers, or 
is that going too far? So I think, uh, well, I think basically if the workaround for Windows works, we should base that should be official. It should not be unofficial at this point. We shouldn't be pushing people to a page that says like, you know, this is not officially supported yet. Because I think Windows is an important thing to support, um, especially if you want to get into enterprises and stuff like that. Uh, if we want to broaden the base of the community, um, you know, telling them that they that it, it does work, but it's not officially supported is a big deal. So I think that would be the number one thing. I don't think the installation process is that big of a deal. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I think it, Jekyll is pretty easy to install, um, and because. I think the, the reaching beyond the community of, of hardcore developers is more about the usage of the site after it's built, not the building of the initial site. I think you're going to mm. need a, hard, a developer to build the initial site always. It's just a matter of can we get it so that people can you know can contribute to these and we can work in larger teams that aren't we don't have to like teach uh, teach them nuances of all kinds of uh, complicated abstractions and, and things like Markdown and so on. So I think that's how we reach beyond um, just a niche community, which, I mean, stack site engines are growing, but it, it's still somewhat stuck in a niche, I think, and I think part of that is that when I talk to people about it, they, it's, you know, well, I can't, I can't even, you know, deploy this for my company and then have anybody contribute because mm -hmm. they don't know Markdown. They want to send me Word docs, and then I'm stuck converting everything and so on. So it's like... Um, that's the big issue for me right now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, final question. Uh, you mentioned that you judge the um, different static site generators a lot on the health of their community. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere that Jekyll, do you think, could uh, learn from the other communities, um, things that are, things that are, they're doing well to demonstrate their community health? Hmm. Uh, I'd say, honestly, no. Uh, I think Jekyll's community is probably the, the strongest, and I think even this conference shows, like, you know, nobody else has anything else like this going on for any of those engines. Um, so, so far, I haven't come across anything. Some of them are, are healthy in terms of, you know, as a, a lot of it is about where, how easy it is to find people who are using it and find resources and help on, you know, uh, when you get to something that isn't necessarily covered in the documentation. Um, and I think Jekyll has that already. Jekyll, like, I've never had an issue finding out how to do something in Jekyll. It seems like somebody's already tried to solve it. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, right now it's sitting in the position of having the strongest community of the ones I've looked at. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for taking the time uh, this morning, or well, this afternoon, I guess, for you in, in Boston, uh, to talk with us at JekyllConf. I know there's a couple of other unanswered questions uh, sitting in the Twitter stream. So it'll be great uh, for for you to jump in there and answer some of those. Um, I'm just going to introduce our next speaker, uh, if that's all right with you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian.